So hello, my name is Stephen Cretney and I'm with the West Kootenai Climate Hub. Today, we're happy to have Craig DeLong join us to, uh, to give us the path forward. Welcome, Craig. You can jump on and share your screen. All right. Uh, thanks, Stephen. And I'm going to turn my um, video off and I would like you all to do the same if you would please. Uh, that shaves power. <laughs> And that's part of what we're talking about. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. You be seeing it now. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Welcome. And thanks for attending. Clearly, governments at all levels had not been doing enough to adapt to and mitigate the impacts of climate change. So we, we need to act locally. Today, I want to share some of my thoughts on how we can do that. Just a minute. I'm not sure why it's not moving down. Hmm. There we go. It's slow, slow today. <laughs> Okay, a little about uh, Kootenai Outdoor Environmental Learning Society. Um, so we uh, concentrate on fostering an appreciation of nature through the development of outdoor skills and an increase in its understanding of the environment. Uh, we want to raise awareness about the human impacts on the environment and what people can do to reduce their impacts and to assist community groups, industry, and all levels of government develop infrastructure and programs that encourage environmental sustainability. A little bit, bit about me. Uh, I have an MNC in natural resources management. I have 42 years in forest ecology research um, on things varying from uh, fire ecology to drought to uh, mixed wood ecology, uh, et cetera. I've been working for 10 years, working on a drought risk assessment tool uh, that I won't talk about today, but if you're interested, you can get a hold of me. And I've uh, got four years managing a local plastics recycling facility called the Rosslyn Meat Factory that you'll hear a little bit more about. So adaptation, it's all about planning, 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 planning. Plan the work, work the plan. Planning is cheap. Reacting is expensive and sometimes too late to address the problem. We need to learn this. <laughs> we don't seem to be doing a very good job of it. Okay, so the steps are identify the major risks, collect and analyze data, and then develop a plan to address. Fire. So I'm gonna focus on fire. There's you know other things like water supply, flooding, landslides, dwindling snowpack, but I'm gonna concentrate on fire because that's the most I know, uh, that's the thing I know most about. And also I don't have time to talk about uh, all the rest of them. So fire is a concern for most communities and uh, the amount of fire and you know how it spreads and all those things are relative to location, climate and vegetation. We have generic fuel management treatments that have been done in a lot of communities, but we need to identify unique risks compile existing information and tools, change the scale, and develop a detailed landscape plan. So I'm gonna talk about four fuel types. Ground fuels, which are shrubs, herbs, and grasses. Canopy fuel, fuels, which are the crowns of the larger trees. Ladder fuels, which are the younger trees underneath the canopy. And the ones we're most concerned about are the ones that are dead because they burn well and they, they move the fire from the ground to the canopy. That's why they call them ladder fuels. Something you may not have heard before, and maybe I even made it up, it's called airborne fuels. So these are cones, small branches, and bark, and they're very important because they cause spotting, which we'll talk more about. First of all, ground fuels. The ones we're most concerned about are the grasses. Um, in a lot of areas, uh, the grasses, especially after a wet spring, wet spring they grow very robustly. 
and uh, you have tons of um, material there. And then if you get a drought, then they all cure or dry out and they're very flammable. And cured grass spires move extremely rapidly, um, you know, greater than 200 minute, uh, meters a minute um, and can move very quickly into a community with little chance for a response. So solutions to control these ground fuels, well, the best one is probably conversion to an irrigated field, but we can't do that everywhere, but it's the most effective. Grazing and or mowing and collection prior to curing. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is just an example here. Um, this is the big Rock Creek fire, and you can see this irrigated field. It wasn't touched. The fire burned up to it. In fact, the whole fence line burned. It was amazing. There was just this big scorch along the side of the road. The whole fence line burned and the field was untouched. So canopy fuels. The problem is drought is leading to mortality and canopy dryness resulting in intense fires. And the, the most recent fires in, in Kelowna and north of there, they were the most intense that, that firefighters had ever seen. So the solution is strategic removal or preemptive treatment to reduce flammability. And I'll talk more about that later. Then there's the ladder fuels. So um, fire control in some ecosystems has led to a buildup of these fuels because they used to get underburns, light fires, and it would take out these fuels, but leave the big trees, especially Douglas fir and ponderosa pine and larch with the big, big bark, they would be left intact and that would be cleaned out. But now these fuels are building up. And so you can do prescribed fire or you can do mechanical treatments. Airborne fuels. Problem is it leads to long distance spotting. And an example was in the uh, Kelowna fire, um, the fire skipped the lake. You know, it's a couple kilometers wide probably at that point. And um, so the solution there is to removal of some of the cones. And actually we can remove the cones and use them to plant trees across the province. And so it's multiple uh, reasons that you would do that. And also the bark on dead trees can be collected. In particular, lodgepole pine has a fairly thin bark, light bark, and I call these bike bark fire ships. They're loose bark on dead trees, also often a result of beetle attack. And these bark pieces can catch on fire and can be carried huge distances, like 10 kilometers by strong winds. Uh, you know, I learned this from the fire uh, ecologist up north there, and he was saying they had never seen spotting uh, like they had in, in some fires in the lodgepole pine stands up there after beetle attack. And of course, they ignite spot fires uh, inside communities sometime. They had a big problem with this down in Colorado. Um, there, the, the, the fire was five kilometers away, yet one of these things floating in the air and boom lands on a cedar roof then they got a they got a fire inside the community which is you know not not where they want it <laughs> okay keys to fire control rapid detection access and fuel treat so first of all detection we learned a lot. We have a huge, huge amount of, of data in BC. It's one of our strengths. And let's put that data to good use. AI, you've heard all about AI these days, is particularly well suited to the task. It's not just good for cheating on exams and beating the current chess champion. We can use AI to um, take data um, and I'll, so I'll, I'll give an example. So when conditions warrant, um, we deploy detection drones to the highest probability areas. So <clears throat> here's what they call, we call a raster map. <clears throat> so for each of those squares, there's a huge amount of data in those squares about 
uh, elevation, landscape position, whether it's at the top of the slope, bottom of the slope, mid slope, um, there's what kind of forests are there. Now we're getting data on whether the, it, it's droughty or not. We have data on whether it, the dead, trees are dead or alive. We have a ton of data. Now we take that data and we look at the lightning strike uh, data and we say in the past, when a lightning strike hit this polygon, say it was water, what? zero probability of fire. Oh, when it hit this square, oh, that was lodgepole pine on a crest position that was dead with dry grasses underneath. That started 20 fires and they all got big, okay? High probability. So we can assign probabilities. So when lightning does strike in a certain location and we good, have good locations on our lightning strikes, then that probability is assigned by a computer immediately, okay? And then we look at the probability map and we say, oh, damn, this one over here has high probability. So we send the detection drone out and these detection drones are, um, there's a lot of research on it and they're incredible at zooming in on, with their camera and they can detect small amounts of smoke and small amount of flame. And so we send them out there, boom, we got a detection of fire, rapid detection. And then uh, we can send a helicopter out or even better, we can send what I call attack drones. So these, these big drones now, they can carry a lot of uh, uh, water. Uh, I figured it out, I can't remember the number, <laughs> but it's a big amount of water. So you can send, you know, boom, detected fire. Boom, get the drone ready. Boom, out, boom, splash, fires up. Um, now, of course, we don't want to just do this data analysis um, over the whole province. We want to do it in what I call natural disturbance units. So they're ones with uh, a natural disturbance regime that is similar. And so, and each of those would have a unique um, set of uh, parameters and, and, and everything and a set of unique uh, uh, fire regime. And therefore you do the analysis uh, within these NDUs. Um, and you can learn more about that from me later. <laughs> so next other thing I wanna talk about is you've heard of the ring of fire. Well, this is the ring of no fire. So, we identify areas that don't burn, like rock, water, roads, et cetera, even burnt stands, because then it's not a canopy issue anymore. It's, it's still a, a grass issue, but it's not a canopy issue. And you connect these uh, with existing roads, irrigated areas, low burn areas, like wetlands or previously burned, and you treat the gaps and buffers with fuel management treatments. And you, where you have access to them, you bear, bury water reservoirs. You can get some old big tanks, you know, that aren't used anymore, bury them underneath the ground, have an access point. Only the forest fire cider, fighters have access. They can hook up their pump to them and boom, they've got water. And how are they carrying the crew and water? with shirts, something like the shirt, firefighting UTV, it's made for it. And the, the reason for this is because we don't want a big swath, we don't want a gravel swath around the community. We want it natural as possible. And these vehicles are made to go over anything. They're low ground pressure, so they don't disturb the ground. You can, uh, they're up to crew sizes of six. You can have a trailer that can carry water. These are the, the crew in here. They're doing all those treatments I talked about. They're treating the grasses out there um, by, you know, with, you know, there could be in some sections, there could be cattle in other sections. They're just out there with a weed eater and bagging it. We need to get rid of that grass. So this is just an example of a ring of no fire uh, around Kelowna. So you can see it's set back from the edge of the community, quite a ways back, you know, maybe five kilometers. 
And it's, you know, designed to, I looked at Google Earth and I got in there and I did a rough idea of where I would put it. And this is the ring of no fire. So when a fire happens, this is where you have your guys. They're out along this line. So it's like a setting up a fire line uh, before the fire. And uh, I think this could be a really effective technique um, and buffer on either side that you do all these treatments. So in summary, we put our forest data to best use using the latest technology, including AI and drones. Use our resources preemptively to minimize risk to property infrastructure and consider, consider establishing a protective barrier to fire, especially for communities in the most vulnerable portions of the province. Now I'm gonna move on to mitigation. The problem is the current supply chain is increasing carbon emissions and is affecting food supply. Potential solution is decentralization and development of modular systems. Mitigation. Many people feel that their changes will make little difference. They've become a little bit apathetic. Um, so I think it's important that we demonstrate what changes can make a difference with actual data, 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 data. I love data, I'm a researcher, but we need data because then that's the way you can convince government. That's the way you can make, you, people can see the difference they're making. Decentralization. There's a long history of centralization with an ever increasing carbon emissions due to transportation of raw materials and finished products. Move, we want to need to move towards providing goods and services locally, like local energy, like local recycling, like local food production, like local repair, all of this. This reduces supply chain issues and, you know, that makes the, the supply uncertain and it reduces carbon emissions and provides local jobs too. This is why we need to do this. People talk about, um, you know, the circular economy, but we need the circular economy local. That we don't want pieces of the computer going to China to, to be fixed or recycled or whatever. We need as much as we can locally. Um, so now there's, I want to talk about modular systems. There's many machines developed in the past for tasks such as recycling and winter food production. Um, in the past, they've been large and expensive. We want smaller machines and they're becoming available and plastics recycling for hydroponics and aquaponics. And we also wanna develop low waste food production facilities. These are closed loop system where resources are conserved maximizing production through control of light temperature and nutrients, low energy consum consumption, and they can augment local food supply. And they have the potential to address supply chain and food security. Uh, there's a big one near Chase. Uh, it happens to grow um, cannabis and salmon, but it's amazing. 90% of the water is retained in their system and the uh, fish feed the, the uh, cannabis, and then the cannabis, there's a connection back to the fish. So it's a very effective uh, system in, in a greenhouse uh, situation. So aquaponics, Moder modular systems are available, but they're relatively expensive. We can do this in the Kootenays. We can make these, it's not rocket science. Uh, there's many DIU systems on the internet and you can design and build for your size of community and then everybody passes that information on. And I want to grow mushrooms as well. That would be an addition. That would be awesome. And I was talking to this lady from Casagar and she said, wow, you know, we could do this. I know of three churches where their basements are essentially empty. And they're having a hard time paying the utility bills. Huh, perfect. 
We build one of these systems inside. It's a closed loose system. You don't have to worry about mold or anything. It's completely closed. 90% of the water is retained in the system and uh, you can grow food and you can help them pay the utilities. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about precious plastic. You got to check it out, preciousplastic.com. Slower, uh, smaller, low cost machines, less than 10,000 versus 50,000 if you're trying to buy a bigger machine um, that's traditionally uh, been available. There's no intellectual property of patents. We got to get rid of intellectual property and patents. It, it, our concerns are too high to, to allow that to still happen. They have detailed instructions, plans, and videos for making many products from recycled plastic. Check it out, www.preciousplastic.com. Repair. Repair Cafe is a community hub where local residents can bring in broken items and get them repaired for free as well as network, learn skills, socialize, and help others. There's over a thousand centers worldwide with hundreds in Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. And there's only 15 listed in Canada and none in the Columbia Basin that I could find. The closest one was Kamloops. Now I know there's little repair cafes that uh, towns have had, but these are permanent. These are you know, cafes that are always open and there's people always there learning and fixing. We need individual and community action. You and your community can make a difference. It's easy to be apathetic and not much effort to make some changes. But we got to realize that every effort nudges the curve and temperature increase. Anything you can do to nudge that line down, we're very close to 1.5. We don't want to get to 2. We don't want to get to two. Meaningful and measurable change. So these are changes that can make the most difference as a community. And they're measurable. That's important. Data is valuable. Um, so you demonstrate change over time. You create an example for other individuals and communities. And you can show the government, we did this. We saved you know, X amount of uh, carbon emissions by doing whatever we did. You got to measure it. So I'm just going to go uh, through a few things. Um, so obviously there's different things you can do. You can buy a more efficient vehicle. Uh, you can change how you drive. You can buy solar panels. You can convert to heat pumps. A lot of people are doing that. We need to do more of it. I'm going to talk about one simple thing, and that's driving the speed limit. It's a no-brainer. It's safer, saves money on gas or electricity and possible fines, reduces your carbon emissions, and I've found it's a more relaxing drive. Here's your green speed. This is for gas or hybrid vehicles. It's in that range between 50 to 80, depending on whose data you look at. But look at the steepness of the curve. Once you get into 100, 110, 120, it's big time. So I've done the same 400 kilometer trip multiple times between uh, Rosslyn and Kelowna. And I drove it at least five times, I think in my data, 10 to 20 kilometers over the speed limit and then exactly at the speed limit. And so I've got lots of data done the comparison, I reduced my liters per 100 by one liter per 100, making a difference of greater than $300 a year for my pocketbook and 460 kilograms per year of CO2. Now, I extrapolated that to, to all of Canada, and I, I think I'm conservative with saying 60% of the 34 million cars out there drive over the speed limit. And a lot of them, not 10 to 20, <laughs> they're way over the speed limit. And that, and then I said, I, I reduced the, the, my, I drive a lot. So I reduced the kilograms per year and everything. And I got to 7 million metric tons of CO2 by everybody driving the speed limit. In the USA, it's 54.6 million metric tons. It's not a drop in the bucket and it's a no brainer. 
Now this is for electric cars. Now electric cars, if their, their most efficient speed is like three kilometers an hour. And it, you can see the steepness of the curve that goes up. Yes, they're, they're more efficient, but energy consumption creates emissions. Some people, I don't get it when they call it things zero emissions. It's not zero emissions. Any energy that you produce has carbon emissions. Yes, hydroelectric has one of the lowest carbon footprints, uh, but again, I did the analysis with some data from a guy that owns an electric vehicle, and you're still reducing your CO2. Uh, it's not as much, but it's still, you, know, you still are, are doing good. Let's put it that way. And we, do, we don't often include the environmental impacts. The more hydroelectric dams we build, it has a huge impact on wildlife, on habitat, on uh, invasives, the impacts go on and on. So you're gonna groan here, but driving over the speed limit makes no sense. Driving the speed limit makes you sense. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna talk a little about the Rossum refactory here. It's a local recycling facility under uh, the coals, under our society. So the goals are to make products from local waste, primarily plastic with small machines, improve production efficiency and develop and test new products. Then we provide this in courses to teach local entrepreneurs and people who want a second income to start up new businesses, designing and making products from recycled materials. Okay, so this is what we do. There's me making some stuff with the injection machine. So we take plastics, including um, CD cases, which aren't currently recycled. And we make ski scrapers, we make house numbers, make a bunch of other stuff. If you go on the community, you can see uh, our, our new machine that we're going to get. We can make bricks, we can make uh, uh, all sorts of stuff. So this is the current recycling model. So it gets collected locally. You know, the guy drives up, takes your bin off the street, and then it goes and gets bundled up. And then it gets sent down to uh, Vancouver, where Merlin Plastics pretty much does all the pellets. And then it might get made into some recycled product in BC and sent back to you. A lot of it goes global. And then it comes back to you. Craziness, absolute craziness. The, the uh, you know, the carbon emissions from all that traveling, it, you know, it's just crazy. Um, so we got to change it. So this is the, the future recycling model. So locally, the plastics is collected just like before, but it goes down to an operation like ours and it's shredded, okay? All of it is shredded locally. Some of it is returned to you in the community right there locally because we can make a whole bunch of products out of it. We're not gonna be able to use it all, but we shred it all because then that shredded takes up way less room. You can imagine a bundle of plastic, it's got all sorts of air in it. So you're shipping air. You're, you know, and that's that's a supply chain carbon emissions and co higher cost. So it's all shredded locally with with shredders that are as little as ten thousand dollars, and then it's shipped down. And then, as much as possible, none of it goes out of BC, and it's kept in BC. All, um, you know, with huge reduction in in supply chain car carbon emissions. We need to change. I uh, coined this term many years ago in a forestry uh, conference. The greatest barrier to significant change is incremental change. Because incremental change makes the people feel like they've done their job. You know, they've taken the recycling out or they bought a little, you know, more efficient vehicle or I turned down the heat. 
we need significant change. Much of our, we need much of our energy and food produced locally. We need most of our waste recycling done locally. We need most buildings to meet net zero coal. We need significant change. Ideas, we need to inspire one another. Crazy ideas with finesse become good ideas and with dollars become game changers. Especially you young people out there, don't be afraid to put your ideas out there. You know, and don't worry if someone takes your ideas and makes money out of it. Who cares? The need is too great to be worrying about intellectual property and who, whose idea it was in the first place. Just get it out there. We need to, to make these changes. We need, we need great ideas. And um, in fact, I think we're probably going to put an idea a link or an idea um, on our website, the Coles website. So look for that and share your ideas. So the way forward, plan, don't react. Plan, don't react. If you listen to any climatologist, they'll say this is the biggest thing we've got to learn. Collaboration, cities, regional districts, businesses, nonprofits, innovation centers, we need to collaborate. I think we should have regional tax forces. Uh, you know, I live in Rosslyn. I, I belong to the SC and we have local task forces, but we don't have a big budget, so we can't do much. We need regional task forces so that we can combine dollars and combine thoughts. And, and with that, we can do a lot more. We need information sharing, none of this pat stuff, continuous improvement, total information sharing. We need decentralization and we need scale, scaling down of technologies and processes. We need to change the way we drive. Uh, you know, and in Norway and New Zealand, they've got it nailed because they, they have cameras everywhere. If you speed, you're getting a ticket. I got I got a ticket for six, uh, 66 in a 60 zone. And so people don't drive fast there. And they're lowering their carbon emissions. We can need to change our purchasing habits. We've got to wean ourselves off Amazon. There's containers out there that are half full because Amazon and other companies say three-day delivery. We promise it. It doesn't work. Even if they have the greatest computers in the world, it doesn't work. We need to buy locally. So we're planning to develop a website that features products made in the West Kootenai with online ordering. Then make use of intra-city commuters like, like uh, Rideshare, an app to link drivers with business owners so that we can be moving goods with somebody who's going there anyways. No additional um, carbon emissions. So be part of the solution. Join the revolution. And if you want to help, contact me at, at email or contact the West Kootenai Climate Hub. And, uh, you know, I'll, I think you know all how to get there. And um, that's it. And I just want to hold it. Uh, just a minute. I wanted to share just one other thing. And here it is. Um, stay tuned for the first annual Kootenai EcoFest. So put that in your calendars. Be there. There'll be more material shared on uh, my website, uh, the Coles website, it's not mine, it's Coles, <laughs> and uh, also on the Climate Hub. And uh, that is it. So now we're open for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. That was fantastic. Um, we are open for, for questions. So either put a question in the chat, which I do see there's already one in there, um, which I'll read out, but or you can unmute you can go off video or go on video. You can ask ask them in in, in real self your you know your own way. Um, otherwise, you can type it into chat and I, I can read it out. But um, there's a question here that says Recycle BC says that only a small percentage uh, goes abroad. Are, are we saying that this is not true? 
that uh, depends who we listen to you know um yeah it's hard to get uh really good data um so yeah it, it depends who we listen to less less yes is is going uh you know out there there was more and more of it uh that was going out there they're doing a better job but for instance most of it goes to merlin plastics and merlin plastics won't tell you how much they waste they won't they just say that's proprietary sorry yeah uh, so we have no idea how much is wasted we know that cbc did a thing where they put uh chips in bundles of plastic and some of it ended up at the dump um so we don't have a perfect perfect system we know that it would be way better if we recycled locally it just makes sense like carbon emissions supply chain carbon emissions yes yeah agreed thank you um libby do you have a uh, question there well this is actually frank no oh libby, sorry libby. <laughs> well it's okay oh frank <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I had a couple of thoughts on the, on the talk there that was just happened by Craig. Um, recycling is fine to 40, what, 40 years ago, my wife and I did the recycling before it was even started. But I've learned, I've become less and less a believer that it's a good idea. And the reason being, I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad idea. But by recycling, we kind of go past the idea of we shouldn't be producing it to begin with. And by making products out of recycled stuff, then we have an excuse now to keep purchasing the stuff and recycling it instead of saying we shouldn't make it or buy it in the first place. And, and, and I know the reality is that that's the case. Mm -hmm. The case is that it's already there and therefore we should make use of it. But the downside of that is then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of that, well, okay, we're going to keep doing it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like government uh, making profits from selling uh, alcohol or cigarettes, either one, and, mm -hmm. and that, that's part of their tax base. Well, now we got to make sure we don't lose that tax base, so we got to keep selling cigarettes. And it's no. kind of the same so idea. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't totally disagree with you, but the thing is, there's so many things that they're not going to find an alternative for, to, you know, in in any time uh, in the near future. Uh, you know, they're not going to stay stop making computers out of plastic or or there's so many things. So we've got to keep recycling. But sure, we've got to concentrate. And that's all about uh, disincentives. We've got to start taxing them uh, heavily for making products out of things that they shouldn't be making them out of. So it's all about that balance between tax. But we we got to have recycling. Otherwise, it's just going in the garbage. Oh, no, I... It doesn't make sense to me. Um, and if we recycle it locally, um, you know, then, then it's a lot better because we have a handle on it. We have control over it. Um, we know that the carbon emissions are lower because there's no... There's no uh, you know, it, it stays in the community. It's completely done in the community. It's what I call local, um, uh, eh, lost the word there, circular economy, local circular economy. People, you know, boast about the circular economy and say we're doing great things. Well, we're not because, you know, there's still a lot of carbon emissions with supply chain because they're sending the pieces of the computer in all sorts of different directions and there's still a large uh, car uh, carbon emissions from supply chain. Got to do as much as we can local. Yeah, the circular economy is fine. And if you break that circle, it doesn't work. And therefore, we have to keep producing the waste plastic to keep that circle going. And that's my problem. Mm, yeah. You know? well, yeah. Yeah. And, well, it, okay. It, it, it sure. almost sounds like, Frank, you're, you're, you're saying... Um, exactly what Craig said earlier, these incremental changes aren't what we need. And it seems like potentially recycling is an incremental change where we're actually needing to completely change and stop producing a bunch of the things that I'm just trying to. Yeah, but that that's that's like kind of. Yeah, like giving up and just throwing it all in the garbage. 
That's no. not a pollution. No, I'm I'm not saying that at all. Like I said, they're, they're recycling. Well, I, I, I agree with you, Frank, but but it's a balance, and we'll just let's end it there. Okay. <laughs> my 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 other issue was was, okay. and and this doesn't apply to any particular person here. I mean, none of this does anyway. But um, when we're we were talking, or when you were talking before about um, mitigating for climate change, you know, and I understand it. I mean, I mean I'm trying to fireproof my own house and stuff. I, it's, I, I totally understand why people do it. But once again, it goes against the idea of that we need to really solve the problem. If we mitigate so that we build dikes so that the flood doesn't affect us, why do we need to fix the problem? We don't need to. We're not going to have you flooded. We don't need to fix the problem. I'm, my house is protected. So I'm kind of, I understand why mitigation happens. It's kind of going after the problem. Uh, well, uh, you're talking about adaptation, really. Yeah, like walls to create, that's adaptation. You're adapting to the effects of climate change. And one of the problems is, is we're already past the point where these things are not are they're going to start keep happening we're past the point when when they're where they're not we can't prevent them from happening anymore we've blown past that point these are going to happen every year and no matter what we did if we shut off everything carbon emissions over the whole world this would still be happening because we've blown past the point of no return people don't understand that we're way oh, yeah. past that so so we have to do these things. Otherwise, our communities are going to burn down and flood. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I understand what you're saying. The problem is that it gives people a sense of security in the sense that, well, now we're protected. We've, we've done controlled burns, so my house isn't going to burn down. We've built dikes, whatever. Whatever it is we do, we've done these things, and that's good. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's I don't think people are that. I, I don't. I just agree with you, Frank. I don't. People think. I don't think you give people uh, not enough credit. People are smart. They they, they know this stuff. Uh, so just you know. Well, they may know this stuff, but then I don't see why you bother telling them to drive slower if they know it. They obviously don't know it, and they don't do it. You know? Yeah, because, because, because they, people like you. they don't know it can save them money, Frank. Yeah, they don't. Money is always been another because problem. that's what that's how the data works. You need the Hi. data to show them. <laughs> Is it so, okay to take this offline yeah. so that we can move on to another yeah, area? It's exactly. very actually, fascinating. Leslie, and... please, Leslie, just a sec. Um, I did want to actually hear this one last thing out. Um, and then I was going to move on to the next person in the line, which is Zen. Um, but uh, Craig and Frank, I do think that this can be taken beyond. But if there is, like, this is the kind of actual debate. And, and there are some real things being said here that you both are are actually agreeing in a lot of things. Um, yeah. Agree. Is there any last little points on these? We'll, we'll take it off screen. <laughs> Do right. a debate somewhere else. All right. Um, Zen was actually up next. They had a question in the chat around, uh, um, sorry, I'm going to scroll back up to that, around recycling glass and, and paper locally. How does that um, happen? Yeah, so so paper recycling, um, it, it's a little trickier because there's the inks and stuff. But people, for instance, use paper now um, on their gardens to suppress weeds. Um, there's a girl in um, in Rosslyn that collects a lot of the paper and uses it in her. She's a brilliant the, the butterfly making the and so uh, I don't know the whole. Uh, and then glass, yeah, glass, uh, what we should be doing is we can, using local uh, like forges like that they, they use for clay and you can make all sorts of tiles and all sorts of stuff. It's it's on our my list, our list um, to do that. Um, but you can only do, you know, we need more people. We need more volunteers. Uh, it's hard getting volunteers. We need people out there to help us do this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Salida, you posted early that you had a question. You want to unmute and ask that? Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, so I, um, I mean, of course, um, reduction uh, is the thing I'm most interested in, but recycling definitely plays a role in this. And I'm just thinking about, um, you know, like obviously incremental change is not working for us, but how could we do like wholesale change and, I, and with the resources that we have right now. And so I'm just gonna throw some ideas out there. One was, you know, we have this climate corp and right now, um, you know, it, we're using it for mostly like, um, like um, outdoor stuff, like more nature based stuff. But I mean, why couldn't we have a climate core that incorporates all that stuff, recycling, figuring out how to use waste um, and, you know, create systems of um, use um, in our local area. Like another example is um you know like why why do we not push more for um a food sovereignty act where we are more self-sufficient and we can um reduce some of the rules and regulations for the small producers and then be able to sell stuff in bulk so that not everything is not coming in packaging I mean, we get excessive packaging because of the food industry um so like these are like you know like let's look at where the biggest waste streams are coming from and what kind of policy changes can we make right now with what we've got um, to try and mitigate that? Yeah, well, no, ab absolutely. And that's what I was uh, talking about where we need a Kootenai wide or West Kootenai wide um, uh, task forces so we can work on some of these problems. And, you know, like, like in Rawson, we have a zero waste co-op. We buy bulk cheese and yogurt from uh, Jersey land in Grand Forks. And so that reduces, I've got calculations on how much it reduced. I don't have a lot of people in it. Um, you know, and I, I drive from uh, Kelowna to Rosslyn all the time. So I go to <clears throat> the, the Jersey land and I get this stuff and they wrap it in paper and I bring it to Rosslyn and there's zero uh, emissions additional emissions because I'm driving there anyways. And that's what I was talking about, this whole ride share. Right. So uh, so when so, you're talking about task force, like what what like it's it's a colossal bunch of issues we have to work with. What like if we were to make a task force right now, what do you think would be the best way to approach it? Like do we go to the RDCK and we say, look, there needs to be there needs to be a whole new position created to just manage this kind of this kind of um, research and development, and like for example, like you know, we already have. Let's. I'm going to take transportation as an example. So you know, when we're looking at RDCK budget for services and stuff, highways isn't really included in there. They already have someone that looks after all the transportation. Mm -hmm. But what drives me nuts is that. You know, an obvious solution, of course, is public transit, which is very limited in the budget. It has to come out of property taxes and they get a small budget from the BC government, whereas highways gets a huge amount. But what if we what if we change it so that we actually in a task force, we actually have people that are employed that are looking after these issues that typically didn't have anyone looking after them? Yeah, well, and is that, that is that like an approach that maybe we should we should work it, towards it, like it, right away? Exactly what I was talking about. Because if it's West Kootenai wide, then you have a bigger budget because all the towns, Castle, Nelson, you know, they can all throw money in, and then you can afford to have a full time staff person. So that that's the key to me, and um, yeah, and I think it's again something we kind of take offline and talk more about of people who are interested. Thanks. Sounds good. Uh, Leslie, you're up next on my list. Okay. I have a specific question going back to the beginning. Um, one of the things that City of Nelson is doing close to my house, between my house and Stephen's house, I guess, there is a, um, around the highway, there is a huge grassland that has caught on fire. And I've seen that fire spread at 200 um, meters per minute. Yeah. Um, so what the fire department is doing right now in conjunction with um, Modi and um, wildfire services is they did some of the treatment, but in the spring, they're going to plant um, a mix of uh, zero scape 
wildflowers. What is your thought on that as a, a mitigation or a protection for us as opposed to mowing it? Last year, they thought about bringing in goats, but that was too hard to do. Um, so now they're trying to not make it full on grass. Do you feel that's less burnable, more production? I, I mean, yeah, native flowers. I mean, I mean anything, even if you're planting native plants, it's not really a natural ecosystem because we've planted it. So that kind of goes, as an ecologist, kind of goes a little bit of, uh, against my grain. But certain situations, uh, yeah, sure. But the thing is, you have to have that further back. As I said, it's got to be five kilometers up the hill somewhere. That's where you want that barrier. Because once it's gotten down that far, as in the, the Kelowna example, once it's gotten down close to your community, you're hooped. It's going to burn your house down. I don't care how much uh, control you've done. Uh, because it builds inertia. And once it's built inertia, it's virtually unstoppable. And so that's why we need these ring of no fire established well back of the community. And that's where your line is. That's where you get the fire to lay, lay down. And that's where your treatments around your house and stuff, they make a difference because mostly because of these um, bark fire ships and, and other cones and stuff that can might start a little fire near you but we need to think further back. Yeah, nice. Um, thank you, that, that's great. And actually, uh, yeah, it's weird when there's fires right in the middle of there. Um, I'm gonna quickly go to the, the chat box, which had a question around wondering how I get in on the recycling classes. Are they on Zoom? Cause this person is in Creston. Um, yes, some of it would be Zoom. And uh, so a lot of the basics, like building a budget, you know, all that sort of stuff, that would be all online uh, or mostly Zoom because we're not ready for making online courses in that yet, um, but that'll come. But then we'll actually drive out to Creston with our injection machine because it's in transportable and we'll just run you through how to make a house number. And we're even going to have a, a program where you can uh, uh, use before you buy. So we'll give you a machine to use. And before you invest the $3,000, the injection machine is super cheap, like $3,000. Um, so we will, we will go out there and we'll leave it with you. And we'll show you how to use it. And then you can use it for a while. We'll provide some shredded plastic for you. And then you can say, oh, yeah, after a month, yeah, I don't know. It's not working for me. Or, yeah. And then you order your, your, your own machine. And then we take back ours and then move it on to the next person. So th that's the formula. And uh, stay tuned. That's a really, uh, really neat initiative. So, yeah, they can e anyone can email you um, and, uh, and get more of that information. We've only got a couple minutes left. Um, and I know that there's a, in a, a couple people who have been waiting. Um, I will get to Janet in a second, but Brian, you just wanted to quickly follow up on the planting, the native plant um, piece. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's pretty important to address what's already there to see if whether or not those grasses are already there. Because if there, there are already native grasses, then it's likely that these grasses are already pretty adapted to fire. And I mean, they just will naturally burn. And like, obviously like we're trying to reduce fuel source, um, but planting native plants necessarily won't burn less. I mean, especially like a lot of native plants have a high oil content to, 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 to a begin with. So like, that's, it's hard to say whether or not, like it's certainly not a bad idea to, to, or at least it's not often a bad idea to encourage the growth of other native plants. But in terms of like fuel source, I don't think it's like you have, you have to be very picky on what you actually plant and just like throwing a wildflower seed, seed mix there. Yeah. You're likely going to be introducing non-natives. Yeah, no, I agree because a lot of that seed has other seed mixed in. And, and uh, one of the major grasses is pine grass. 
And uh, it's shown to be very good uh, forage mm. for cattle. So you go out after it's green, just when it's finished greening up and you go got a bunch of cattle in there, boom, before right. it cures, you know, in, in that area, what I was talking about, that 200 meter, 400 meter, I mean, we can work on the width, but you, and the thing with grasses is once you've created like even a hundred meters, the fire just stops. Mm. The flame front just goes boom because there's no fuel in front of it. It's not like a crown fire where there's, you know, it can jump because the flames are driven by wind and, and, and it's so high up that they can jump from tree to tree to tree. But on a grass fire, if you create a swath, it essentially, boom, stops dead. So, you know, we, we just need to clear it, clear it out. You know, I think there's a good chance that in this grassland, there might be some non-native such as like, like common tansy or even scotch broom and like plants like that, that have a high oil, oil content. I think it does make a lot of sense to mechanically remove those yep. and, and stay on, yeah. stay on top of those non-natives that have high oil content, such as tansy and scotch broom. Yeah. Um, those are the ones that come to my mind, but I'm, I'm sure that they're, oh, no, uh, you know, absolutely. And, um, Hey guys, guys, I'm going to stop oh, you right there, Craig. Okay. Um, just because we are at the end of the okay. hour, okay. there was, I don't know if, if um, uh, Jeanette is still on the call. She had raised her hand a long time ago oh. um, and was patiently waiting and not sure. A lot of people have been dropping off because we're at the, at the end of the hour. Um, there was one other question from the the um, chat around something around higher level groups working on initiatives toward policy change for taxation around plastic production. Um, I don't okay. know. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I know. And and. I'm, I'm a doer. <laughs> I get frustrated with policy and spending a, a, a bunch of my time trying to change policy. Uh, I'm a doer. I'd rather concentrate on what I can do locally to, you know, get stuff going. And, uh, and that, that's, 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 that's where I want to spend my energy. <laughs> that's great. Well, I really want to uh, thank you, Craig, for coming and, and giving this presentation. And also thanks to anyone who's joined us um, today. Uh, yeah. It would be great to see you in a, in a month at our next webinar. Um, there are, uh, someone had just put on, uh, the Brian had put in, in the um, chat his email address if anyone wants to talk about native versus invasive plants. Craig, do you is your email in the chat box at all? Oh, um, get it in no. there. Yeah, um, it, it was on the PowerPoint. There. It was on the PowerPoint, but just yeah, if we at can the get end, it. not on the last slides. Do you want me to? Yeah, just copy and paste it in there in case anyone wants to reach out you, uh, to you specifically. It'll be yeah. easier. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming. And chat. Um, Looks like there's a, uh, you know, a deep dive discussion online next week with the first things first Okanagan um, group, which is a climate hub type group. Ah, um, why can't I get into the chat? It keeps popping up with all, everybody okay. else. Yeah, of course. So it'll take forever to. Laura, get, would you be able to put um, Craig? Yeah, email it's, in? yeah, it's the Coles one. There it is. Well, we else society. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sorry, oh, that's I, I put that's, your personal one in there. That, that's fine. Um, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up with an email with the, with the uh, Coles one. And uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Craig. Thanks. Ciao.